Ocular toxoplasmosis is one of the most common causes of posterior uveitis caused by an intracellular parasite. The definitive host for Toxoplasma gondii is the cat in which both the sexual and asexual phases occur, while humans and most warm-blooded animals serve as the intermediate hosts where only the asexual phase occurs. There are three infectious forms of Toxoplasma gondii, oocysts, stachyzoids and bradyzoids. The definitive host is the cat in which sexual reproduction results in the formation of oocysts that are shed in the cat's feces. Oocysts undergo sporulation in the environment resulting in the formation of sporozoids. The sporozoid containing oocysts are ingested by the intermediate host where the sporozoids are released from the oocysts and get transformed to tachyzoids which are the active infectious form. The tachyzoids then go into the dormant phase as a result of the host's immune system and form bradyzoids which reside in the tissue cysts. Humans can get infected by one of several mechanisms eating undercooked meat containing tissue cysts, consuming food and water contaminated with cat feces containing oocysts, blood transfusion or organ transplant and transplant sector. Uh, bradyzoids remain in tissue cysts in the brain, retina and muscle for years, but tachyzoids can re-emerge and cause toxoplasmosis in immunocompromised patients. Tachyzoids infiltrate the eye preferentially through the retinal microvasculature and can navigate across the the rates of fetal transmission depend on the stage of gestation of acquisition of maternal, primary maternal infection. There are no reports of congenital toxoplasmosis occurring when maternal infection occurs greater than three months prior to conception. A few cases have been reported when infection was acquired two months prior to conception. This information is of practical value in counseling and management. Fetal transmission is low for maternal acquisition in the first trimester. The risk of transmission increases with gestational age of maternal infection. Earlier maternal seroconversion results in more clinically apparent disease in the fetus and can result in death and spontaneous abortion. Fetuses affected due to late maternal infection have more of subclinical infection. It follows that perinatal mortality is greater in earlier acquired maternal infections. Fetal infection doesn't occur during maternal reactivation due to immune protection. However, infection with a different strain might cause fetal infection. So overall, 40% of primary maternal infections result in congenital infection. The risk of congenital infection is directly proportional to gestational age and severity of disease is inversely proportional to it. The classic features of congenital toxoplasmosis is described either as a triad of chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus and intracranial classification while Sabin also added cognitive impairment to the classic features. However, less than 10% of infected children have these classical findings together. Retinochoroidal lesions are the most common lesions of congenital toxoplasmosis with 85% of them being bilateral and predominantly in the macular region. The typical lesion is that of a hyperpigmented macular scar, also called a wagon wheel lesion. It consists of a central area composed of glial and pigmented material connected by pigmented strands to a peripheral ring of pigment at the edge of the lesion. Even if no lesions are seen at birth, about 85% of children develop retinochoroidal lesions within a few years and about 25% of them become blind in one or both eyes. Other ocular manifestations may also occur. None of the systemic features of congenital toxoplasmosis are specific and can mimic infection with cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex virus, rubella and syphilis. Toxoplasmosis that occurs in children and adults may either be due to reactivation of congenital infection or due to a newly acquired infection and commonly manifests in the second through fourth decades. Immunocompetent persons with acquired toxoplasmosis may have asymptomatic cervical adenopathy. Otherwise, systemic symptoms are usually absent. On the other hand, encephalitis, pneumonitis and septic shock are some systemic manifestations of toxoplasmosis in immunocompromised persons. 
a typical lesion is that of a fluffy white focal retinochoroidal lesion with a moderate degree of overlying vitreitis producing the classic headlight in the fog appearance the lesion is a full thickness necrotizing lesion often situated adjacent to a pigmented retinochoroidal scar though sometimes the lesion may occur without an adjacent scar the scar is believed to harbor cysts that release organisms on rupture causing adjacent retinitis cysts can also exist in normal retina thus explaining some lesions without an adjacent scar the lesion due to acquired disease is more often unilateral in contrast to congenital toxoplasmosis and has a slight predict- predilection for the posterior pole the patient presents with blurred vision and floaters and the findings are often accompanied by either a non granulomatous or a granulomatous uveitis with uh, a frequent incidence of significantly raised iop other atypical features are seen more commonly in immunocompromised and older individuals they include retinal vasculitis which is more common in the vicinity of an active retinal lesion and may be in the form of arteriolitis wherein segmental periarterial plaques are seen in a beaded pattern and are called kyrillis plaques uh, venular involvement is seen in the form of perivenular infiltrates and sheathing sometimes partial thickness lesions that only involve the inner or outer layers may be seen punctate outer retinal toxoplasmosis may be seen in young immunocompetent persons as single or multiple dull yellowish variably pigmented deep retinal infiltrates that may extend up to the inner plexiform layer and may be associated with srf port lesions are hypoautofluorescent and active lesions on ffa show early hypo and late hyperfluorescence they may be seen in eyes either with or without other toxoplasma lesions the lesions of punctate inner retinal toxoplasmosis are focal temporary inflammatory lesions that appear superficial creamy yellowish white iso autofluorescent in contrast to port lesions that are hypo autofluorescent in the macula or elsewhere in conjunction with typical or port lesions in contrast to port lesions that show early hypo and late hyperfluorescence inner lesions show hyperfluorescence in both the early and late phases of ffa optic nerve involvement may be due to reactive inflammation due to a juxtapapillary retinitis or a true nerve involvement as as a result of parasitic invasion showing disc edema with venular sheathing retinal lesions may be absent and neuroretinitis can also occur macular edema can be in the form of subretinal fluid of varying severity adjacent to a macular retinochoroidal lesion or in the form of cystoid macular edema rarely a huge outer retinal cyst may occur other atypical features include very large multifocal bilateral diffuse retinal involvement pan uveitis and unilateral pigmentary retinopathy the most severe retinal lesions may also be seen in patients receiving steroids without concomitant antiparasitic therapy various ocular complications may occur in untreated cases vascular occlusions usually occur in areas where the vessels pass through an area of retinitis retinal detachment may be either regmatogenous or traction recurrence is higher in the first year after retinochoroiditis and in persons who are younger at first presentation in aids patients recurrence is the rule if not taking antiparasitic therapy pregnancy and cataract surgery are also risk factors for recurrence however patients taking concurrent steroids for other indications have a very low risk of recurrence if they only have inactive toxoplasma scars Typical lesions are easily diagnosed clinically while serology helps in confirmation of exposure to the parasite IgG antibodies appear 2 weeks after infection and last for life in varying titers 
that is why igg antibody positivity in the absence of local or systemic evidence of infection has no clinical relevance however a rise of igg titers over a 3 week period may be used as an indicator of recent infection igg antibodies cross the placenta a negative igg antibody titer rules out toxoplasmosis IgM antibodies rise in titer in early infection and last about a year. Since IgM antibodies do not cross the placenta, their presence in a newborn confirms congenital infection. Detection of toxoplasma specific IgA antibodies is more sensitive than IgM detection in congenitally infected babies. The presence of IgM antibodies in adults and children greater than 12 months of age indicates disease acquired within the past year and a rising titer indicates active infection in immunosuppressed subjects positive serological tests indicate infection however negative tests do not exclude previous or concurrent infections the more common screening test for these antibodies is by elisa and chemiluminescence immunoassay these tests are better however they are expensive and not easily available The IgG avidity test is being used to help differentiate between acute and chronic stages of infection to help in treatment decisions and limitation of effects especially in pregnancy and immunocompromised individuals a low avidity index generally indicates acquisition of infection in the last 3 months a high avidity index indicates infection more than 3 months ago and an intermediate percentage has no uh, value The IgG avidity test probably has greater value when combined with an IgM ELISA test. More invasive tests are sometimes needed in cases of diagnostic uncertainty. PCR of both aqueous and vitreous may be performed. Another test which has met with good success is the Goldman-Whitmer coefficient. It is the proportion of specific IgG in ocular fluid versus serum samples and is calculated using this formula polymerase chain reaction is also useful for amniotic fluid testing after 18 weeks of gestation for prenatal diagnosis of congenital toxoplasmosis to decide on the management strategy a couple of facts need to be known Toxoplasmosis is in immunocompetent persons resolves over 1 to 2 months even without treatment and drugs for toxoplasmosis are effective only against the tachyzoid stage and not the bradyzoids in the tissues the goals of treatment would be limiting parasite multiplication during active retinitis along with limiting the duration and severity of symptoms of acute infection reducing the risk of permanent visual impairment by reducing the size of the eventual retinochoroidal scar and reducing the risk of recurrent episode regarding the indications these three situations definitely warrant treatment people are divided in their opinion about treating immunocompetent individuals but in general the following conditions would definitely benefit from the use of antitoxoplasma drugs lesions threatening the optic nerve or fovea decreased visual acuity lesions associated with moderate to severe vitreous inflammation lesions greater than 1 disc diameter in size persistent of disease for more than 1 month and the presence of multiple active Uh, lesions however there are others who prefer to treat any degree of severity of the disease the classic regimen consists of a combination of pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine pyrimethamine is given in a dose of 100 mg on the first day and a maintenance dose of 25 to 50 mg per day for the remaining period sulfadiazine is given in a dose of 2 to 4 g per day for 2 days followed by half to 1 g four times a day Folinic acid is added to the above regimen in a dose of 5 to 25 mg with each dose of pyrimethamine to prevent myelosuppression. Clindamycin in a dose of 300 mg 4 times a day may be added to the above regimen or substituted for sulfadiazine in cases of sulfa allergy. Systemic corticosteroids in immunocompetent patients is often added to the classical regimen in which case it is referred to as triple therapy. 
triple therapy plus clindamycin is referred to as quadruple therapy steroid should only be given under the cover of anti toxoplasma drugs treatment is given for 4 to 6 weeks and then the patient is reassessed in immunodeficient patients however treatment is recommended for 4 to 6 weeks beyond all clinical manifestations often up to 6 months or longer and this longer treatment is required because of the frequency of cerebral involvement and frequency of recurrences on stopping the medication some people prefer cortramoxazole for its cost and easy availability uh, clindamycin and steroids may also be added two alternatives that are sometimes used are atovaquone and azithromycin these are quite effective for the retinal lesion but are not very effective in preventing recurrences in pregnancy recurrent toxoplasmosis poses minimal risk to the fetus and thus there is no indication for treatment solely for the purpose of preventing vertical transmission if primary infection is acquired prior to 18 weeks of gestation or acquisition of inf- infection just prior to conception cannot be excluded then spiramycin in a dose of 1 g 8 hourly is used this treatment is continued throughout pregnancy even if an amniotic fluid P- uh, pcr is negative to avoid the possibility of an earlier infected placenta causing fetal infection in the later gestational period if primary infection is acquired after 18 weeks of gestation or if fetal infection is confirmed or highly suspected then pyrimethamine sulfadiazine folinic acid combination should be given if amniotic fluid pcr becomes positive or possibility of fetal infection is high in a woman who has been taking spiramycin then from the 18th week onwards the spiramycin treatment should be switched to the pyrimethamine sulfadiazine folinic acid combination pyrimethamine is not used prior to 18 weeks of gestation because of its teratogenicity alternatives are clindamycin atovaquone and azithromycin in case of non availability or intolerance or alternately intravitreal clindamycin along with short acting periocular corticosteroids may be given sulfonamides may be used safely in the first two trimesters of pregnancy in congenital toxoplasmosis a newborn is treated with the classic regimen with uh, pyrimethamine sulfadiazin and folinic acid treatment is given for 12 months drug treatment to prevent recurrences of toxoplasmosis are recommended in the following situations patients with hiv aids uh, history of frequent and severe recurrences Uh, it is to be remembered here that recurrences in immunocompetent persons are greatest in the first 1 to 2 years after infection toxoplasma scars adjacent to the fovea as recurrence can cause significant visual morbidity prior to refractive and intraocular surgery as these have been reported to trigger recurrences cortramoxazole 3 times a week is used for prophylaxis surgical management may be required in healed cases with persistent vitreous opacities retinal detachment severe refractive vitreitis preventing fundus examination diagnostic aqueous or vitreous sampling and cataract surgery if the lens is opaque if you like this video you may show your appreciation by making a small contribution to help support the channel here below the video window click on super thanks choose the amount you would like to contribute and then click buy and send to complete the transaction thank you